a Bastille Day unlike any other. Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. Welcome to the France 24 debate. This July 14th, no parade on Paris's Champs Elysees for France's national holiday. The traditional martial displays of might scaled down to a military ceremony, Place de la Concorde. There, medical workers in white were invited to stand front and center for an emotional clap for carers moment. We'll ask about the significance of the ceremony, what national security means in a year when an unexpected virus has proved more lethal than any army or insurgency, what national security means, what being an essential care worker means, that tribute to medical staff along with pay raises for nurses and doctors announced Monday, not enough for those who chose to demonstrate this Tuesday in several French cities, it begs Another question, that top-down approach to governing France may work when the president's also the commander-in-chief. How does it work, though, in a crisis of this nation? How does it sit with a broader population? We've seen the number of COVID cases creep up again in this country. And when it comes to social distancing rule, your leader has to decide, do you use carrot or stick? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at 2020's Bastille Day and uh, joining us uh, to talk about it from the northern French city of Lille, Dr. Philippe Amouyel, who is professor of public health at uh, Lille's teaching hospital there. Thank you for being with us. Hello. We want to welcome from the French capital, Anne-Elisabeth Boutet, a columnist and correspondent uh, for the Daily Telegraph and the Sunday Telegraph. How are you? And uh, from the uh, uh, Normandy city of Rouen, the Normandy capital of Rouen, Laura Slimani, who is uh, the recently re-elected uh, municipal council, now deputy mayor of Rouen. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter. The hashtag is F24debate. Yeah, before we go to our panel, uh, let's go to that scaled-down ceremony that took place this Tuesday morning, this July 14th, in the French capital. A special Bastille Day ceremony taking place in an extraordinary context. As the world continues to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic, July 14th celebrations in Paris were redesigned to pay tribute to the heroes who kept the country running during France's two and a half month lockdown. Instead of the usual world leaders and dignitaries, some 1400 doctors, nurses, cashiers and other frontline workers were invited as the president's guests of honor. In another break with tradition, the ceremony was moved from the Champs-Élysées to Place de la Concorde, which was closed off to the public for sanitary reasons. It began with an homage to Charles de Gaulle, 80 years after his famous appeal from London, followed by a toned-down military parade, which put forward the soldiers and medics enlisted in the fight against COVID-19. As fighter jets flew over the crowd in a trail of blue, white and red, Military personnel were joined by a group of frontline workers, including doctors, janitors and mask makers. In a symbol of national unity, they stood around the French flag as the national anthem was played. Before receiving a round of applause by the president and his ministers. The ceremony took place a day after Macron agreed to an 8 billion euro package for nurses and healthcare workers in a deal that's left medical unions divided. Dr. Philippe Amouyel, that, that tribute, was it fitting? Uh, what was your reaction when you saw those images? Well, I think it's very interesting because um, it was very hard times. Um, I'm um, usually uh, physicians that do mainly public health. Then we had uh, so many work in the north of France that I need to go back to the hospital to help my colleagues just to uh, try to work with uh, this COVID-19. And I think it's something that we appreciate it because maybe you know that at the time of the COVID-19 in February, the hospital are already a lot of problems, a lot of work, not enough people, not enough money, not enough beds. 
And then the COVID-19 uh, arrived, and despite uh, this uh, terrible conditions for hospitals, everything was pretty good. I never had such a period in my life as a physician in my hospital. So I think there was a lot of work where, uh, which was done there, and I think it was some ideas to uh, honorate this um, physicians, nurses, and all the people, because it was not only uh, uh, physicians and nurses, but all staff at the hospital was really committed just to find solutions and to save uh, as many lives as possible. Yeah, the, the, a moment uh, of solidarity that's being remembered. And as you say, it's not just nurses and doctors. Coming out of this crisis, when we see the men and women in this country who kept France running during the worst of it, what's your definition of an essential care worker? Oh, that's somebody who can uh, at any times be present and concentrate on uh, the patients because you should know that at least during uh, two or three months, everybody was concentrated only on the patients. I was only working with the patients, uh, all the nurses, all the staff were there, and it was very positive. I didn't see any people complaining. Everybody did the job as far as possible, even exhausted. So it was really a, a unique situation in my uh, physician life. That was very interesting. Yeah, it, it, we heard in an interview, we're going to talk about it in a moment, with uh, the French president, uh, Laura Slimani, Emmanuel Macron saying, in this country, our divisions, we don't know how to handle them when we're not in a period of crisis. you agree with that statement? Um, honestly, I don't really know what it means. Um, I think we are a country where there is a tradition of fighting for social rights, and I'm really proud of that. And I think the president should be proud of this also. Um, and it's very, very legitimate that um, health workers, but also a lot of other categories of the population have been asking for better working conditions um, and for better wages. Um, what is happening with the Segur is a first step, but it's we'll, we'll clearly not about, enough. We'll talk about that in a moment. What, what, what that, that's that, um, uh, that agreement that was reached uh, with, with care workers. But I think he was talking more broadly uh, about the fact that when we look at what's happened, uh, what you ju just heard described by, by, by Dr. Amuyel, uh, and what's going to happen now with the recovery plan, the idea that the French pull together better when there is a crisis than uh, in times of peace. Yeah, well, I'm not. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, now I understand the sentence. I, I'm not sure it's 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 particular to the French. I mean, I think it's a it's a basic uh, human instinct. You know, obviously, crisis of course uh, reveal and unfortunately the best in people. It can also reveal the worst, but it can reveal the best in people. And I think this is what we have seen during COVID nineteen. Um, but the crisis. I mean, this was a big crisis, COVID. But what we have to understand is that some of these workers live and work in a permanent state of crisis. And this is the issue that, that we have to address, not only responding and, and you know, um, thanking uh, uh, civil servants, um, health workers, care workers, but also um, people who clean the streets, people who dealt with the waste, uh, people who um, uh, work in supermarkets, you know, all these kinds of, all, all of these people who, who, who allowed France to continue um, um, having, a, well, living properly, um, you know, they, they deserve more than just uh, a 14th of July um, homage. They, they also deserve uh, real action. Uh, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's nice that the president notices that the French have been solidary. They have been. They've also volunteered a lot. Um, but um, I think this also shows that there are a lot of a lot of problems in our society that needs to be resolved because otherwise we're always going to go from emergency to an em to other emergencies and not find structural solutions to structural issues, which the hospital uh, is one of them. Yeah, did, did that ceremony strike the right balance? I'm going to ask you, Anne Elisabeth Moutier, because if you're coming from a foreign land and you arrive in France for the first time and you see, boy, the way the French celebrate their national holidays with a military parade, and even here, Yes, the care workers were front and center, but only after uh, the president had uh, uh, filed past uh, some of the units, after we'd heard military music, there'd been plenty of, 
of marching and uh, flyovers by military jets. Well, I mean, you have to remember that, yes, this is the anniversary, not of the, uh, actually not of the taking of the Bastille, but what is known one year later as the Fête de la Fédération, when the French briefly came together with the idea that the revolution and, and, and what remained of a of royalty would cohabit well, and like in most revolutions, it didn't work out. But what really this means, this military thing, it means in uh, 1792, when the armies of seven countries and empires attacked France, and, and the French defended it themselves with something that even an Englishman, Richard Cobb, called the people's armies. Uh, uh, so that's really what it shows. Um, and, and France is a country, unlike Britain, and like America, that has been attacked on her territory very often. So you've got to take this into, into account before you become sort of, you know, hot under the collar about it being militaristic. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing, I mean, the thing of um, inviting the, uh, the care workers and inviting people who had kept the country running, uh, you know, couriers, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, cash assistance, that sort of thing. That probably was a very good idea. I like the idea that the, uh, the ceremony was hijacked uh, lightly with two balloons carrying a banner complaining about how badly uh, uh, a hospital had been treated in various budget cuts over the years. Um, but it's it's very symbolic. The French would not have it otherwise. I know that in uh, uh, 2017, Emmanuel Macron made a point of inviting President Trump uh, to this parade because the point was to show uh, uh, the American president uh, a country that was powerful, that can deploy uh, um, tens of thousands of soldiers in operations abroad. Uh, that is the strongest military in 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 the. Um, in the in NATO and in, in uh, apart from the United States and certainly in the European Union and all of this was a show of strength but it's a show of strength that is not you know saying that it's going to attack anywhere um, if you remember that the French for instance voted uh, against uh, taking part in the in the war in Iraq so I think it's pretty well balanced here and I, I know that in the country people take this uh, uh, more or less in stride you can you can have uh, an element of posturing, but most of the time I would say that we don't see this as a rattling of sabers. It's very different from, say, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Russian annual military parade where it, essentially you're looking at stuff that could attack Europe any moment in the past and, and still remembers that it could at one stage and is not saying that they will. They just take bits and pieces. The French don't do that. All right. And we, we knew that Dr. Amuyel was coming. So we were paying particular attention to social distancing during that ceremony. And I got to say, there were mixed messages. The director general of the World Health Organization, who was one of the guests of honor the day before, warning uh, world leaders not to send contradictory messages and to be very firm. And we saw a little bit of social distancing throughout the ceremony. But the only time where Emmanuel Macron wears a mask during that ceremony, Dr. Amuyel, is when he goes to salute the head of the WHO. Uh, I think you are, you are really right about that. Uh, and this is the reason that you write down with my colleagues some words about that. You know, I yeah, think there was, there was, If I could interrupt you, there was, you penned a, an open letter calling for mandatory yeah. masks in public places. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that uh, during the, 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 um, uh, the containment, uh, French people did pretty well. Uh, despite some uh, exceptions, uh, everybody uh, did the jobs, stay home, avoided contacts. And what to observe is that the reproduction number that what define what uh, an epidemic or a pandemic is, uh, was dramatically decreased. Then, uh, very recently, we had this uh, new um, end of the containment, and we could see that three or four weeks after, everybody just forget that uh, we had that virus still alive all over France. And our main area of concern today, my main area of concern, but also as one of my colleagues, is that we would not, we would like to avoid a new um, epidemic wave in October or September. And the only way is to keep strictly on the, all the measures, all the masks, all the distanciations, and all that thing that a little bit bothers us in our 
day-to-day uh, -day life, but are clearly necessary until we have a treatment or a, a vaccine. Uh, this is the main problem. And what we see is that we got the question of the election. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, what that appears just before uh, the, the lockdown. And then after that, we can see them going and visiting people without masks or very close, especially when you have to make a picture at the end of the trip and everybody takes off the mask. I don't think this is a good example for France uh, and for the French people because, uh, you know, we say that um, legs are following heads. And there, if Ed doesn't show off very well what to do, so the, the legs go anywhere. So really the idea is, is to have the opportunity to tell the government that we need to maintain some of these measures and particularly uh, the mask. Keep mask on, of course, not in your car when you're alone or not in the, in the street when you are walking almost alone with a uh, large distance between people, but really when you are in small shop, when you are in a restaurant, when you are uh, in a place where there is not a lot of uh, uh, ventilations and where your chains to be contaminated are very high. It's the only way to stop and to maintain very down the epidemic. Yeah, and uh, we heard an interview with the French president. That item was most anticipated after the return of his new prime minister from French Guyana, where the number of cases has spiked. And we were all expecting him to announce, and he says he will, but in the coming days, uh, uh, rules making it mandatory to wear the mask when you're in indoor public places. Let's listen to Emmanuel Macron. La meilleure prévention, ce sont... The best means of prevention against the virus come through what we call barrier gestures. Masks, keeping your distance and hydroalcoholic gel. We must keep applying that behavior. We have seen weaknesses, so I've asked the government to act. And in the weeks ahead, I would like the wearing of masks to become mandatory in all indoor public places. I recommend to all our fellow citizens to wear masks as much as possible when they're outside and definitively when they're inside. We're going to observe the situation to be able to possibly, from the 1st of August, make it completely mandatory. Laura Slimani, you agree? Well, yes, I think we have to make sure that the uh, epidemic doesn't start again, even though, from what I understand, it's going to be very difficult to do that, um, given the fact that uh, there is no collective immunity at all and there is no treatment and there's no vaccine. So I'm not sure how... Um, from September onwards, things are going to work out. And I think as, as local elected representatives, we're also very worried of the consequences it might have on um, the schools uh, opening, uh, on cultural activities, because it's also important that life uh, keeps going. So we have to find the right balance. But I think obviously the condition for that is that people are careful um, wherever they are. Um, but, but, but I also think that there maybe lacks a bit of clarity in the rules that are put in place. Um, to give you an example, we have in Rouen um, some uh, open um, court uh, kind of bar uh, festival kind of place where um, basically they've cancelled all of the concerts to make sure that there's not too much uh, social, you know, uh, that people are not too close to one another while dancing, etc. But on the other hand, you see that in some private bars, they're allowed to organize uh, private parties or uh, DJ sets where people actually do dance. Uh, and we've seen what happened in Nice and we've seen what happened in different areas. So I think there's yeah, also no, no, a lack to, of just clarity. To, just to explain to our viewers, in Nice the, on Saturday, a lot of people were shocked to see this big yes. outdoor techno festival. What did they think make of it in Rouen? Well, I think it's it's both, you know, a bit, um, as I said, a bit unclear then what the rules are, but also very frustrating for the actors that are respecting this legislation, especially cultural actors that are in very big uh, difficulties right now and, and trying to survive through this crisis, even though a lot of the festivals have been, well, all of the festivals have been cancelled this summer. So I think that there's also one, one thing that's important is to be clear about the rules. Um, that are in place so that there is not um, uh, the feeling of injustice uh, that is being felt at the moment by some of the smaller actors, maybe the less uh, lucrative actors that are feeling like uh, uh, they're, they're being taken a bit uh, for imbeciles while others are, are, um, are not respecting the, um, uh, you know, the, the, safe, um, the safe ways to, to, to conduct events at the moment. And on that score, uh, we can uh, turn our gaze across the channel uh, from this Tuesday, if we look at the front page of The Guardian, 
uh, uh, rules are being uh, set up so that from July 25th, uh, the wearing of masks will become mandatory uh, in, in all public indoor spaces. Uh, of course, the, the, the British tabloids uh, each wow. taking a different view according to which which paper you read. The, this tabloid, the Daily Star, taking a, a, a dimmer view of, uh, again, mixed messages from, from the government uh, over there. Uh, and Elisabeth Moutet, your thoughts on masks, and we've talked about it already on this show, about how in the U.S. we've seen it's part of almost a culture war. How's it playing out here in France, and how's it playing out in the U.K.? Well, I think uh, the message in France, after a fumbling in the first, say, six weeks, the message has been pretty clear. Uh, and uh, people perfectly understand that you need to wear a mask in an enclosed space, not so much because it's going to protect you, but it's going to prevent the others from some sort of hearing from you in the term of, you know, an aerosol of tiny droplets that might contaminate them. So if everyone is wearing a mask in the in, in an area, an enclosed area, where there's no air circulation, then you're fine because everything is stopped at the point of emission, so to speak. And I think that's understandable. I've taken trains. Everybody uh, was wearing a mask. I go shopping in my local supermarket and everyone everyone is wearing a mask uh, in, in the street I myself do not wear a mask because it, unless there's a crowd there's no use it's no use everybody has uh, um, uh, um, explained that uh, if you walk in the street the, uh, the just the the walls of the of the air even when there's no wind is enough to disperse uh, the aerosol and and that's that's something that's easy to do the masks are now freely available uh, lots of people have sewn up things and and that, I think that was pretty clear after after the family of the beginning. In, in Britain, it's entirely different because the government has not had uh, a, they've not had a, bad, a good COVID in the best of times. They started, they had two competing teams of scientists and one uh, preached herd immunity. And we know perfectly well that, you know, that is unacceptable in terms of too many casualties before we have herd immunity. Uh, and they then they made a U-turn after a a couple of weeks, and that was that was tragic because that those were the key weeks in which lockdown would actually have uh, prevented uh, uh, exponential growth of the virus in Britain. And it's the same thing about masks. It's not like America. America is is really it's become a world of its own on that. But in, in Britain as well, there's a, a very strong sort of debate on. Do we, at the time when we're going into Brexit at the end of the year, uh, do we want to weaken our economy? So we need to go back to work. Uh, so we want the end of lockdown. And at the same time, they find it uh, the still difficult there's a little bit of cultural war about the mask as well uh lots of people went to the pub for the first time last week and uh the uh, uh, uh the non-respect of either wearing masks in some places or any kind of social distancing meant uh that the government has had to express you know the threat of, of making things more difficult and now they've made masks compulsory uh partly i think i think macron is only coming to this now because of the uh the rate of infection going back up with the r in paris going above one one person who's got the illness contaminates one other person if you're above one if you're in the in the point something you're fine if you contaminate more than one person uh then uh, there's the threat of the second wave i think the uh, british government is not uh, convinced of this but they were incredibly mushy in explaining all this in the past two months uh, with a result that people do not trust them and it really all about trust philippe amuyel I, I know you're a medical doctor you're not a sociologist but uh, what is it about the French and masks? Because we hear all kinds of things. Oh, they don't like to wear them. Or uh, what is it about? Why are we cultural? Why do we have a cultural problem with wearing a mask? Um, I don't think we have a cultural problem. Just take the example of the beginning of the epidemic. At the beginning of the epidemic, we were lacking masks, and everybody wanted to get masks anywhere, anyway, and to put them on. That was very interesting because I think everybody was feared by uh, the, the, the COVID epidemics. Then we had a period where we could get masks and everybody put them on. And what we see now, let's say for two or three weeks, we see that um, a reduced number of people are wearing masks with all the the idea behind that, it is finished. We don't speak anymore on the TV about the number of cases. We see each day the number of deaths decreasing. That's very good news. And they just want to be free and to find the world as it was before the COVID crisis. And I think nobody tell them that this is not the reality. Um, 
actually um, the, the infection is down, but not totally stopped. And what we discovered um, two days ago from a, a, a British publication is that we cannot get immunity more than four or six months. That means that all the theory about the collective immunity is down now. And this is not a surprise for us because you may know that we know already coronaviruses, the, the ones who goes only in, in humans, not the ones who go from animals to humans. And uh, we ha all have done this type of coronaviruses. Once in our life, it's like a common cold and you do this, you can have these common calls every year. So you don't have a specific immunity. But what we see is that some cells get the memory of the virus and help you to be stronger when you find back the, the coronavirus. Do you're ruining my day, we doctor. Do doctor, you're that. ruining my day because I did the test last week. I tested positive for the antibodies and I thought, great, I'm free. Yes, for the next six months. That's good for you. Uh, you, you have a nice summer. But uh, take care when you, you, you go at, on work in September or October. That, that's a big problem. What, you call the, what we call the immunity, the classical immunity by antibodies, just like you had in your test, for this disease, it does seem to last no more than six months. But we have a cell memory that helps you to combat it. And once you have seen it, you will be more stronger the next time you will find it and get a lower disease or lo lo lower type of disease. But uh, this is a problem. And so we now must be aware of that. We now must be aware that we need to keep the economy up. We don't, it would be a big, big mistake if we have a, a, a new lockdown, a complete lockdown. Uh, what we need to do is three things. Is first to use the, the barrier measures and especially uh, the mask. Second, to do testing, as you've done. That is, uh, when you have symptoms, when you have something like this, uh, just go and test. And if you're positive, identify your contacts, isolate them. And isolate them, and this is a problem in France, not at home, in a different place, because the, the largest number of clusters actually is in the families. Of course, you have some clusters in some um, uh, in some industries or in some specific uh, occupation, occupational groups, but the main clusters come from family. A cluster is more than three cases in the same place. So if at home you are four and one of them have COVID, automatically three of them will have. So it's really in the day-to-day -day life that the virus progress and persists. So it's very important that we have these measures, but these measures don't have to stop the economy. We have to know how to work with a mask, how to work with colleagues, um, stop as we do in France, uh, shake hands and kiss every day and every minute. So all these things is a new uh, philosophy that have to happen. And I don't know how to transmit this information, but what I clearly think is that our politicians need to show the way in that direction. They should be wearing their masks more often is what you're saying. Um, Politicians who have heard the cries uh, from uh, people uh, who did clap for carers in this country it was every night at 8 p.m. during lockdown. And so we had a big conference that took place last few days, wrapped up some of the unions signing on for pay rises. For other unions, it's not yet enough. Those pay rises giving more money to uh, medical staff, particularly doctors and nurses, Let's listen to the new French Prime Minister. Il s'agit d'une forme de rattrapage par rapport à des années de retard où chacune et chacun, et peut-être même moi-même, a sa part de responsabilité. Yeah, too much bean counting uh, over, the, over the years uh, by uh, those uh, who wanted to... Uh, uh, tighten the belt of the state at the expense of uh, public health. Uh, well, as we were saying, not enough for some. France 24 is Chris Moore uh, covering demonstrations taking place uh, the other Bastille Day, if you will, here in Paris. Over at Place de la Concorde, uh, Emmanuel Macron and the French government are very keen to show that they were paying tribute to health workers, uh, amongst others who 
as you can imagine, our national heroes here in France in the wake of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. The context, as you said, is pen being put to paper on an extra €8 billion Euros for France's uh, public health sector. A lot of it going uh, in pay rises to nurses will get uh, an extra €183 Euros a month on average. Not all unions uh, are happy uh, with that and some of them are leading what for the moment is a relatively small uh, demonstration uh, against this and the government's attitude to the health sector uh, in general here at the uh, Place de la République. Now, France's health system just about uh, held up uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, despite at one point having to call uh, on, on the country's neighbours uh, for help. But these unions, other critics of government policy, uh, say that the COVID crisis exposed uh, a lack of resources, a lack of funding that had been going on, not just under Emmanuel Macron, but under his predecessors, Francois Hollande uh, and Nicolas Sarkozy. You've been hearing also about some of the other problems uh, facing the French president, not least uh, COVID-19 uh, triggered unemployment. Bastille Day is traditionally kind of the time when the French uh, knock off for the summer, but it's also uh, a country in which politics often play out on the street uh, and it's likely to be a challenging autumn, I think, uh, for the French president and his government. Yeah, before the show, Laura Slimani, we were saying we, we don't remember there being a demonstration. French do like to demonstrate a lot. We do play to stereotypes, but uh, demonstrating on Bastille Day, I don't have the memory of that. Um, yes, no, me neither, um, I have to say. But um, I think, yes, French people demonstrate a lot. But I, I think, um, uh, you know, in a lot of countries now, there are a lot of, you know, in the US, people demonstrate a lot also. And, and so we have this image of the French. Um, you know, it's it's true. We are, as I was saying earlier, um, a people who, who wants to fight for their rights and to voice their concerns in the street. I think it's very uh, healthy democratically. Um, but yes, no, I mean, on 14th of July, I've never, uh, I've never seen it before. I think it's because um, there was this, um, you know, a debate or this discussion uh, present, well, with, between the president and his journalist and uh, the announcements that were indeed disappointing for part of the, um, of the health sector, uh, which, I mean, in my opinion, uh, you know, what they announced is the least uh, they, they could do. Because what, what is it the least, but is it also the most? I'm asking the question because you have two contradictory forces. On the one hand, that public pressure to uh, to do more for for our healthcare service, and on the other, the fact that well, we're we're staring at a deep recession. Yes, but I mean, again, it's always, um, you know, there's always a very strong feeling of injustice there. I mean, we know we are going to face a big economic crisis, but the president still hasn't said that he was going to go back on the massive tax cuts he uh, uh, gave the richest people in France at the beginning of his mandate. Uh, or maybe he said earlier, but I'm not sure he did. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it, we yes, it is the least we can do after, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people have died in the hospital, all, partly because our system is not uh, good enough and because um, the working conditions are not good enough because we didn't have enough masks, you know, for many reasons. But, you know, we've, we've had to reach this, this huge crisis so that uh, the demonstrations and the claims that, ha that uh, the health workers have been making for months and months, you know, they were demonstrating and, and on strike for months and months before uh, the COVID-19 crisis, actually. And now they are getting what they have been asking for uh, months, you know, so I think it's it's only fair that they do, but at the same time we are lacking a more global reform of the health sector and of hospitals as well in terms of governance, more democratic, more of a democratic governance, um, in terms of uh, prevention, in terms of uh, environmental health. You know, we would need a big a big reform, and the government is not uh, doing that, and he is not even uh, cre recreating or uh, re-injecting social justice in its reforms, in its fiscal system, uh, while, while, you know, this is what we need to do if we all want to face this crisis together and it not only unraveling on the people who are already the most uh, precarious and in, di in difficulty. And Isabel Moutet, you, you, you heard Laura Slimani express it there, uh, but if you read, for instance, the New York Times this Tuesday, they're gushing about the fact that uh, France has a, a much better system to ha handling this pandemic than does the U.S. Uh, how's Macron doing? 
Oh, he's not quite doing as well as Angela Merkel, but he's in the first, he's at the bottom of the first, first third, and that's really a passing grade. Uh, I, the, the, the American handling of the pandemic has been terrifying in so many ways. Um, I, there are several things about this. I think there was this, this uh, medically, I, you know, in the beginning, uh, um, um, Ms. Slimani said, uh, we, the, everybody, every nation uh, does well under pressure. And actually there is something which makes the French not so good at team playing, which makes them very good when you've got to be virtuoso in, term, in periods of emergency. And that's been seen time and again. And um, I know uh, a specialist of French-American comparisons who calls it the D'Artagnan complex. And suddenly the doctors had to cure people and they had no bureaucracy, no forms to fill, no sort of extraneous administrative tasks. And they, they were exhausted, but they faced up to this private hospitals, private clinics, sent people and everybody was working together. And that is exactly the kind of, of instance in which the French are good. Uh, the other thing is that there were certainly orga organizational problems. And one example is the fact that uh, we couldn't get authorization through the various myriad uh, administrative bodies that control health in France for uh, veterinary labs to make tests, even though biology is biology and they could have made tests, the biological part at any rate. Uh, and uh, that's the sort of thing in which uh, the layers of French bureaucracy, which were terrifying, should be addressed. But on the other hand, uh, there have been cuts and there have been reorganization in French hospitals that are pretty dire. But there's also been a, a, a lack of organization in that I know several uh, heads of departments in, in major hospitals who say, look, I've got budget to hire nurses. I can't find nurses. And there's a combination of the general rate of salary being too low. French doctors are paid half what English doctors are paid. They're paid half what German doctors are paid. Uh, they're paid under the median salary uh, care personnel in the country. And that's something much bigger in terms of how do you reassign the expense? Um, and that's, that's something that has to be looked at. Philippe Amugel? Um, I, I think it's not just a question of money. I, I just want to, to, to mention that because um, we are also lacking physicians. Uh, if I take the example of uh, general practitioners, it's very difficult in France to find a general practitioners, especially in certain uh, places, in certain town. So I think uh, money is one of the questions. The second question is the way you pay for hospitalizations, the reference. I think this is another point which is very important and the assignment of the different type of hospitalizations. We have public hospitalizations, but we have also private hospitalizations. This should be better defined. What, who is doing what and for what price? And third, I think, is the way we are, um, how do you say, educating our physicians and forming new physicians uh, and nurses also and uh, all the health workers uh, because we are missing these people and the population, this is a good news, is growing older and we need more and more uh, general practitioners just to help to handle all this increase of chronic disease. So I think it's a first step. And as um, the prime minister says, it, it, we are catching on some, some elements, not in a far as usual, but we are doing a little bit. But I think we have to think also about the way how we recruit physicians, what are their missions, if they are in the public domain or if they are in the private sectors. And I think these elements need to be discussed. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to solve a lot of programs actually in France about uh, We're medicine. out of time, Dr. Amouyel, but it is Bastille Day, so I have to ask you this question. You remember at the beginning of the crisis, Emmanuel Macron was kind of told off, you might say, by the, French, by the German president uh, who, who said, you know, we're fighting a virus, it's not a war, it's not a foreign army, and to tone down effectively the martial language. Do you think Emmanuel Macron today strikes the right tone when he comes to this crisis? Um, I think he, he made some progress. I think I, I, I didn't appreciate the, the, the naming of the comparison with war. This is not war. Uh, we're not killing people just to kill people. We are just trying to avoid killing people. This is a health crisis. It's not a war. But um, what we need today is to prepare to live with this um, disease as long as possible, as long at least as we find a, a vaccine or a treatment. But um, the message are very important and the exemplarity of our uh, government is also very important. So uh, I hope, I sincerely hope that 
um, we can go forward uh, with this uh, barrier measures and also uh, maintaining our economy because uh, this is another point that we really need to respect and I really fear what could happen if we had the second wave in, uh, in October. So uh, please uh, keep All on right, Dr. Masks. Abu Yel, Philippe Amuel, one of the co-signatories of that open letter calling for the mandatory wearing of the face mask uh, in indoor public places. Thank you so much for joining us from Lille. I want to thank Laura Slimani for being with us from the Normandy capital. Thank you. And Elisabeth Moutet in the French capital. Happy Bastille Day to all of you. Happy Bastille Day to our viewers. There's more on our website, france24.com. À La Réunion, la plupart de nos plages ont été transformées euh, en cimetière. 11 deaths in 10 years. Surfers, swimmers, all killed by one of man's few predators, the shark. In recent years, shark attacks have increased on this French island in the Indian Ocean, an island that is divided between those who are pro and anti-shark. The attacks are hurting the economy, tourism, and Réunion's image. Our reporters have been to the island paradise to find out what's being done to shake off its Shark Island image. On va aller réabater du, euh, du matériel de pêche euh, au requin dans le cadre d'une campagne de pêche préventive qui est, euh, qui est ordonnée et organisée par, le, par les autorités et les pouvoirs publics. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com. More than 1,000 animals have died on this Northern Cape game farm over the last few months as South Africa's entire Kalahari region is being crippled by one of the worst droughts locals have ever seen. We are trying to go on um, as, as we are at the moment, but it's only going to be so, so long before our, all our resources are, are, are out and, and we don't have any money left to do what we do. Turu Lodge, like so many others in the area, is heavily reliant on international hunters to keep the business afloat. But recently, none have arrived. Unfortunately, the, the drought forced us to, to place all our bookings on hold. Um, we can't book a guy coming from overseas, having the, the safari feeling and trying to give him the best safari he ever had. But, but he, there's, the animals that's here are very skinny. And, and is dying. They currently spend around $14,000 a month just on feed, trying to keep the animals they have left alive. This job goes to one of the few remaining staff members, Paul. He has been on the farm for 28 years and always depended on tips from visitors to supplement his income. But this year, he struggled just to get his kids ready for school. <laughs> I needed to borrow money this year just to buy them books and stuff. The years before I had the money. Things are tight, much worse than before. A few kilometers away, lifelong commercial farmer Johann Steenkamp admits he can't keep going on like this past March. Our animals are really suffering. We have lost many animals. At this stage, I have between 30 and 40 percent of my herd left. Everything else either died or we had them slaughtered. Even as the region enters its much anticipated rainy season, the farms and their animals will need more than a year to recover. And many simply don't have that long.